Um, we started Ash, uh, the season of Lent on Ash Wednesday, which is February 14th this year. That was a really interesting day uh, for Ash Wednesday to start. But we, in the series for Lent, are in the Gospel of Mark. And for those of you who have been here long enough, you're familiar with that. We've been off and on in this book uh, for about two years. Uh, we are systematically going from the beginning to the end, and it just conveniently happens during the Lenten season that we're at the place of Mark, we're at the last week of Jesus' life. So all the way up to this point, it's been a fast track through Jesus' ministry. We get to chapter 11, and it's like, and the whole rest of the book from 11 to 16 is the last week of Jesus' life. And so we're slowing down to go through the whole rest of the Gospel of Mark um, and walk through that for the Lenten season. And I'm going to warn you, if you haven't been in the Gospel of Mark before, we call it the Gospel for Christians. And the reason that we're calling it that is because in the book, there's not much content about Jesus' teaching, like what he actually is teaching. Today will be one of the very few moments you might hear something. The, the assumption is that the people uh, know the content of Jesus' teaching. But what's interesting is that in the Gospel of Mark, and we've, if you follow us the whole series, you know this, that the people in the Gospel of Mark who are supposed to be the people that are doing all the right things, meaning living the right way as disciples of Jesus, true followers of the Messiah, they all get it wrong. And all the people who are the outcasts, who most of the time the religious authority or leaders or people who are allegedly the uh, quote-unquote true Jews of the, of, of the group, all of the outcasts do the right things. And now we are in the last week of Jesus' life, and it's like that whole narrative gets turned up to like 10. Last week, we left Jesus walking into the temple courts. We had this weird story about a fig tree, right? And he cursed this fig tree, and may you never produce fruit again. A weird story. Next scene, just like a movie. He walks in the temple courts, starts thrashing around all the money changers, tables and stuff, and all sorts of chaos starts happening in the temple. In other words, Mark was pronouncing that Jesus was saying, the temple's time is done. Judgment has come, and we asked a question, hey, is the church an institution, or is it a people? And I said the answer was yes. But for the most part, what the people do matters. And there was all sorts of references to the prophets. And I say that because some of that stuff is going to come back up today as we continue the journey. Because now, after this scene that's happened, we come to the next scene, which now involves the chief priest, or what it, who is known as the Sanhedrin. So we're going to get into that, Mark chapter 11. We're going to have a pretty lengthy uh, reading today, verses 27. I'm going to go through uh, verse 12 of chapter 12 after that. And I'll be reading out of the New English Translation today. And here's what it says. They came again to Jerusalem while Jesus was walking in the temple courts. The chief priests, uh, the experts in the law, and the elders came up to him and said, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority uh, to do these things? And Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me and I will tell you what authority I do these things. John's baptism. Was it from heaven or from people? Answer me. They discussed with one another, saying, If we say from heaven... He will say, then why did you not believe him? But if we say from people, they feared the crowd, for they had all considered John to be truly a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. And then Jesus said to them, well, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. Very snarky of him is really it. And then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, but he put a fence around it, dug a pit for its wine press, and built a watchtower. And then he leased it to tenant farmers and went on a journey. And at harvest time, he sent a slave to the tenants to collect from them his portion of the crop. But those tenants seized his slave, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. And so he sent another slave to them again. This one they struck in the head and treated outrageously. He sent another, and that one they killed. This happened to many others, some of whom were beaten, others killed. He had one left, his one dear son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw his body out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd because they realized that he told this parable against them. So they left him and went away. Let's pray together. God, I pray in these moments that you would give us fresh ears and eyes and hearts to see and listen to the scriptures being proclaimed, that you would challenge us and encourage us. 
to consider what it looks to live the good news seven days a week. May we be open and humble to what you have to say to us today, of what it looks like to be someone that takes up their cross and follows you. We pray this in the name of Jesus and everybody said, amen. So I know someone asked if I'm putting on the armor today. So uh, for those of you who are new, this is, really, this is a really fun time to come today. I'm pretty much sure you're going to get the whole scope of uh, what the vibe is around here. Uh, today and someone the fact that we're going to talk about some of these things uh i know in other churches would have got me canned pretty quickly so uh I've, I've i've been here long enough i guess uh i'm i'm withdrawing all of my relational capital today so here we go uh how many of you have ever been convinced of something I mean, really convinced only to find out later that you were completely wrong has that ever happened to you before I mean, you were convinced, like, not only you convinced, like, I know for a fact that this is true, and then you found out it wasn't. Have you ever had that happen to you before? Some of you are like, never. Just wait. I, I'm only speaking from personal experience, but it's happened to me many times. And I'm the kind of guy, that you might, I'm pretty passionate and animated and I t if I really hang on to something, I go gung-ho. I, I practically become an evangelist. For example, I call myself a Mac evangelist. So I am of the cult of Apple, and I will be its prophet. Okay? So I, I'm very convinced of how I love uh, Apple products and such. I also recognize that corporations can be really, really horrible, like Meta. Um, now I'm going to get flagged for that, too. So anyway, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, there's certain things when I get passionate about it, I get really into it. I'm not going to say I'm wrong by Apple yet. I haven't been convinced. But it could be. I mean, it might happen. But there's some other things that have happened. Uh, let me give you a couple examples. And this is where, <laughs> this is where I, might, I, I should have put my armor on, maybe. Because they're, they're, both of them are pretty significant experiences for me personally. The first one, something I was so convinced of, is that women were not allowed to serve in ordained leadership in churches. I was the evangelist for that early in my Christian journey. And there's all sorts of, I mean, I got trained in particular ways from, from like schooling to convince me of this. Now, for those of you who are new, we are part of a tradition who is fully supportive of women in ordained leadership. In fact, we have two female elders currently uh, in our consistory, our, our leadership body. So just to let you know. So that, that's our tradition. But for me, I really, uh, early in my journey, was completely against it. And one of the reasons I actually... Um, had put my roots down in this particular denomination tradition was because of their full support of women in leadership. But there was a time where I believed that, that this, was, this was so important that it was practically gospel truth, that, that there is no way I would be a part of a church if they supported women or ordained leadership that I could be a part of that church. In fact, there are people who used to be a part of this church who left this church for that reason uh, after we had several conversations. So, I mean, for some people, it's really, really important. And that was important to me at the time. And this is not a sermon today to convince you of why uh, I should prove to you why women are ordained leadership is okay. That's not the sermon today. That would be for another time. I can't wait for that one, but it will be really fun. But that was, uh, that, that's one thing. I was so convinced. I mean, I didn't think I'd ever be swayed from it. Now let's get a, a lot more controversial. I was also convinced that Jesus was someone who was strictly for Republican values. In fact, that's why I titled the sermon, Isn't Jesus a Republican? In fact, I remember about four and a half or five years ago at this church, I told a story from this pulpit about a conversation I had with a friend of mine about the 2016 election. And already people are like, oh my goodness, because I was trained to never talk about politics from the pulpit, and I was already violating that. And I'm doing it again right now, according to that particular mantra. So I, I said in that conversation who I voted for, which I will not reveal that this time. I don't want to, like, shock you too much. I'm already got some more shockers down the road. But, like, I said who I voted for, and, man, the reaction from people was awesome. I mean, raised eyebrows, physical huffing and puffing, like, <sighs> straightened backs in the chairs, uncrossed legs, deer in headlight looks, whispers. It was glorious. And I was saying all of this out loud as I'm seeing it. It's beautiful. And that's all I said about that. 
I didn't say anything. I didn't actually say who I voted for. I didn't say uh, anything about my opinions about such a thing. That's the only thing I mentioned. The whole point was the idea that I could not even have a conversation with my friend who was a Christian about this because he already had said, I'm basically not a Christian. And I mean, how can a pastor not be a Republican? I mean, goodness, he's a pastor. I did say that. But there were, I, I was convinced that Jesus rose for all Republican values. That authentic Christians surely had to share that. What's interesting is, if you go to other parts of the country, it's the exact opposite. People would say, you can't surely believe that Jesus is a Republican. He's definitely a Democrat. It's amazing. You can go to other places and hear the same exact conversation, but on the other side of the aisle. It's amazing. So which one is it? I'm going to give you a hint. It's neither. But we'll talk about that later. Okay? But, I mean, that's... That's the kind of conversations that people were having. And I was so convinced that God was lined up with one party or another. And that's what I was trained. Even, even the values of our country lined up with those values. And there's a whole mantra. By the way, that's still happening now. On, on, in both sides of the aisle, by the way. In all sorts of ways of how people get convinced by that. And man, friends, on both of those topics, I couldn't have been more wrong in what I believed. And so when we look at this text this morning, we have a text where Jesus is now back at the temple courts talking with the chief priests. I said that the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is the official legal Jewish court of all the Jewish people. They are in charge of like the moral, religious, and social life of all the Jewish people. They're the ones that make legal rulings on the Torah to, when there's kind of vagueness. What do we do about the decision? Well, the Sanhedrin is the one that decides. So they're the official religious authority. That's who Mark is talking about when he says chief priest. These, this is the audience that we're talking about. And what's interesting about this, as we're kind of walking through this, I want you to pay attention to like what, what kinds of responses are these people giving and how is Jesus responding in turn and what does that mean for us? And I think there's a lot, a lot of relevance to that. And if you feel really uncomfortable, all I'm going to say is, I'm really glad that you do. You should. But I hope it's challenging. I hope uh, you f feel that it's necessary to walk through this because Mark's walking through this for some reason. But the first part of the text already presents a problem. The chief priests are questioning Jesus. And on a more practical level, because they said, by what authority are you doing these things? In other words, hey, Jesus, why should we even listen to you? Why, who gave you the authority that you have? It's almost like asking for someone's credentials. And for a Jewish person, that's important. Rabbis have credentials. They usually get, uh, they're usually mentored under another rabbi. And who you, who you get trained under matters, right? It's like, did I go to Harvard, right? Or did I go to GRCC? Those are two different places that have two different types of reputations as far as the academic world, right? So think about it that way. So they're asking Jesus a similar type question. Hey, why should we even listen to you? Because they're the experts. They're the chief priests. They're the people that are in charge. Why do we even listen to you, what you have to say? I mean, who are you, Mr. Jesus? I mean, that's basically what they're asking. And what's interesting is that already it's a problem. I and mean, they're not, we already know in the Gospel of Mark what the chief priests think. Mark's already set this up from the beginning. I mean, he said several times, they are not going to listen to Jesus. They're not interested in listening to him at all. They're actually plotting to kill him. In fact, that's what's going to happen again. We already know the story and how it's going to work. But then it gets into specifics. Okay, Jesus gives a response. He doesn't just be silent. He actually says, okay, I'll ask you a question, which is what good Jewish rabbis do. Uh, when posed with a question, by what authority did John do his baptism? Well, to us, it's like, okay, that's a weird response. Like, why does that matter? Well, here's why it matters. And it says in the text, it gives a little hint, but I'll break it down. If they say that John's baptism was from God, then Jesus is the anointed one, the Messiah, which means that he has the authority from God himself to say what he said and to do what he does. If they admit that John's baptism is from God, that's a problem for them 
because they, they obviously don't believe that. But they don't want to say that. But the other reason is, the flip side, if they say it's not from God, there's a problem. See, by this moment in time, and we know this, Jesus has gained a lot of popularity. He's trending on social media of the ancient world, okay? Meaning, like, there's tens of thousands of people that are following him around. And they just had a big parade for him when he walked into Jerusalem. Remember that? It's very anticlimactic. He's on a donkey, but they're waving palm branches, which was, we said, back to a, a revolt from 150 years before when that, that basically the Jewish people overthrew the current ruling body by violence and force and took back the temple and had a little period of time of political independence. And they're waving their palm fronds and say, this is who, this is who we want. This is Jesus, the Messiah. The Messiah is going to kick, kick the Romans' tail. And we're going to be back on top. That's the parade that happened. And Jesus went in, he went in on a donkey instead of like a horse. And he goes and he looks at the temple and then says, he left. Like, there's really nothing, there's really nothing here for me to do here. It's, it's over. It's too late for you. Very anticlimactic. That's what happened. And now you've got this story where, what's this authority in John it's all about? Now, the Sanhedrin, by this time, here's the thing. They're the chief ruling council. But there's a problem that they're in cahoots with the Roman government. They have an agreement. Roman government says, hey, can you keep your people in line and we'll let you have your little religious independence. As long as you don't get out of hand and riot and revolt against us, you guys can do whatever you want. And the Sanhedrin said, okay, Romans, get to ask a little favor here and there of the Sanhedrin to do for them that may not necessarily be in line with what God wants. And they said, yes. That is the current state of the Sanhedrin. Obviously, Jesus knows this is an issue, and this is what is happening. So how do they respond? They say yes. They support Jesus as the Messiah. And the correct response for, for chief priests in that circumstance is to repent of what their sin is, which is not believing in his authority. Because they're accusing him of not having God's authority. And they say John's baptism of God, then they're directly rebelling against God. They can't do that. That's not a good place for them to be. They can't say yes. They can't say no because he's really popular. And if they say no, the people are going to rise up against them. So they're in a catch-22. Well, they don't have to be, but they are if they want to keep their power and privilege. And that's the issue. They don't want to give up their position. They don't want to admit that they're wrong. They don't want to admit that they've been leading people astray, which is what Jesus is giving them the opening to do, by the way. This is not like, forget you, and walks away. Jesus is giving them a chance. Hey, you can make things right. All you have to do is say yes. And they say, we don't know, which is a very meh answer, right? It's not, it's not a yes or a no, and they're trying to be brilliant, but it says in the text, because they feared the crowd. They feared the people. It's almost like, you know what? If we make this decision one way or the other, there are some people that are not going to be happy. And man, we would never want that. And I think you all know, and if you don't, I'll give you a revelation. You can never make everyone happy, right? Right? But that's what they wanted to try to do. And at the same time, we already know they're not interested in listening to Jesus. And, I mean, have you ever been in a conversation? And maybe you've done this. I know I've done this to my wife on several occasions, unfortunately. And she's let me know. Bless her. Have you ever been in a conversation where someone asked a question of you, but they really don't listen to your response? Like, they're, they're, it's almost like this hey, I'm really interested in you. I'm going to ask you a question that makes me feel like I'm interested in you, but you're, you're giving me a response, and it's like just, wah, I'm like, pay, I'm like I, I get on my phone and start surfing Facebook that's now disabled or whatever, right? Like, I'm just like not paying attention to anything. Is that, you know what I'm talking about? That's what the Sanhedrin is doing to Jesus. And their motivation is completely different. They want to kill him, but they can't really do it in public right now because there's going to be a riot right now. Jesus is very popular. They think he's going to be the Messiah that kicks the Romans out. That's where things are right now. It's in the state of like Jesus is the best thing ever. Why would you ever be against him? If you say something bad, then the people are going to riot. We can't have that happen. So we got to find another way, which in the end of the text it says they went away. 
Jesus catches them in their pride. He tells this little story, calls a parable. Parable are just using like, you know, current imagery or things that they know and telling, having multiple layers of meaning of what this might mean. The good news is, if you were here last week, you already know what this story is because we talked about it last week. That there are references to the prophets, especially in Isaiah chapter 5, about vineyards and fruit. We remember that conversation you last week? We talked all about that. There's lots of imagery where God compares the people to fruit and vineyards and all that kind of stuff. But in Isaiah 5, it was not good news for the people of Israel. They were screwing up. They were like a vineyard that was producing sour grapes, right? You remember that? So they're t- tagging along with that imagery in this parable, but talk about this, this, this owner had these tenants, and they just end up basically taking advantage of the people that are serving under them. They're abusing them. They're oppressing them. They eventually kill them. And then finally, after all that, it's like every servant keeps getting oppressed and exploited and manipulated and murdered. Hey, if I send my own son, surely they're not going to do anything against him because he's my son. And then it says in the text, hey, if we kill him, we get the vineyard to ourselves. And he's telling the story. Now, obviously, it's, it's obvious that Jesus is very, we call it um, hyperbolic. He's, he's using hyperbole or exaggeration right, in telling the story. I mean, this, this circumstance would never happen. I mean, it's way, way above and beyond. That's part of the point of the story. He's telling the story and how ridiculous it is, but it's really easy to know who he's connecting the story to. Hey, by the way, chief priest Sanhedrin, you are the tenants, and God is the owner, and you are exploiting and manipulating and murdering everybody that God sends to you which they're going to do again in this, later in this journey. It's a, it's, a, it's a reality check of what has happened and is happening and what will happen. And he's connecting all this story, and they know it. I mean, it's not, it's not, everyone knows where the connections are. It's not hard for everyone to fix. This is the one, one of those parables that's confusing to people. They know what's happening. Just like Isaiah had talked about in chapter 5. And again, Jesus gives them an avenue to respond to this. Even after telling the story, you can change. You can make a different decision of how you're going to live. But they don't know. They respond differently. It's like Jesus is asking them, hey, you know that thing that you believed as gospel truth? You need to wake up and think differently. By the way, in the New Testament, the word repent, which usually has a lot of negative connotations now because it's been abused, but it's a good word. But in the New Testament, the word repent, metanoia, literally means to change your thinking. In the Hebrew Bible, shuv means to return, like return to the way that you were designed to to live. Put both of those together. This is what Jesus is offering to the Sanhedrin when he tells this story and when Mark is telling the story. So now, let's go back to the beginning of the title, go back to some of the stories I was telling. Last week, I, I even, this is where I thought, maybe I got disabled because I said this last week or something. I mentioned some buzz phrases. I won't say them again. But I mentioned some buzz phrases about what happens when we hear them and our, our tendency to get defensive. And what I said last week, I had a lot of great conversations with some of you last week just thinking through this. And there's a great story someone told me that was really cool about living this out this week, at least the last week or two. I said that if you are a person that takes up your cross like Jesus is calling us to do, there is no room for defensiveness. There is no room for defensiveness for those who take up the cross. So if I hear a buzzword that has a lot of political, especially, connotations to it that get me amped up inside and make me want to start defending or whatever I want to say, God's like saying, take a step back and think about what's happening for a moment. I mean, even when I mentioned that story about the election way back when, four or five years ago, some people couldn't even listen to the rest of the teaching just because I said what I said because we're so amped up to be defensive right away. I mean, some, I mean, 
I had people come, you know, afterwards when, in private conversations, and like, I mean, Jesus is a Republican, isn't he? I mean, of course he's a Republican, right? He cares about Republican values, right? How can you say this? Which I didn't say any of this stuff, right? I just, told, I just said who I didn't vote for in the 2016 election. That's all I said. I told you about one of the other rules uh, of being a good pastor is to never talk about politics in the pulpit. Even mentioning what I'm mentioning has been like, it's like taboo. This is what divides churches. Can I just give you a revelation about the text that we just read? You, you, do you not think that this text is not extremely political? Who is he talking to? He's talking to the people that are ruling. That's what politics is about. Politics is a group of people governed under an authority. That's politics. We have that, by the way. Our authority is who? Jesus. That's our authority. That Jesus is not connected to a political party. I'm just, I hate to burst your bubble, but it's not true. In fact, it's really easy to understand this when you recognize that there were four major political sects of Jesus' day, and he never associated with any of them. You think that's going to change if he came today to America? And he's like, oh, I'm definitely going to be a Republican, or I'm definitely going to be a Democrat. No! He wouldn't do that. That's part of the point that Jesus is talking about. I mean, they are in cahoots with the Roman Empire. It's like they're supportive of the government that's currently ruling over them and adopting some of their values just so they can have peace and do what they want. It's almost like, Roman government, don't infringe upon my rights. Okay, as long as you don't infringe upon how we're trying to rule, that's okay. None of this happens today at all, right? I mean, imagine a group of people who take a political group's values or government's values and then add religious references, let's say the Bible, and then create systems to enforce who's in and out, who's authentic or not, also by protecting the power and privilege they have by shutting out others' voices. I know it's just Bible times, but just go with me. That's what's happening right now. And that's what's so great about the Bible. Look, We've said this so many times. I tell these jokes, and someone's glad they're checking up. Mike told the Bible Times joke this week. Great. Right? Like, I say that because, listen, these stories that you're experiencing right now are not new. They just have different clothes on. And you need to see that. That's why this is one of our values over here, Scripture-focused. This isn't, like, we're biblical. We, I talked about how I hate that word. Because it has been used to abuse a lot of people. We say scripture focus because we say, look, we want to know what the Bible said to the first audience that it was written to. And then it's a bridge. That's the Bible right there. You see a little bridge. It's a bridge to the stories that we're living now. And you realize quickly, look, we're living the same stories. They just have different clothes. There's lots of cultural things that are, are different and historical things that are different. But by principle, there's a lot of things that are very very similar, because the Sanhedrin did not want to give up their power and privilege. That was the fundamental issue that Jesus was confronting. It's like, and, and they put religious context around it and enforced it on people and judged people's identity and worth as a result of it, and they were totally off base. But they knew for sure that this was God's way. They had hundreds of years of history to prove it. And Jesus has some pretty interesting words for them and tells this crazy story about tenants killing all their servants that God has sent. Yeah, he's talking about them. It's not very nice of what he's saying. Jesus isn't interested in siding with a political party. He's interested in being their authority because he is God's Messiah. He is the one, and, and essentially the... The answer to the question of John's baptism is yes, and because of that, God has given him the authority to do these things and say these things and speak this truth. And so I think there's really two challenges that are before us. One is easy to see. The second one will be a little different, something that is in the subtext, but maybe you might not see. So the first one's easy. 
And this is a really interesting question because I, I don't think I didn't realize how entrenched I was in particular ways of thinking and thinking that they were timeless. But how much of your influence about gospel truth is based in American politics? Some people don't even know how much. But when certain buzzwords are spoken and you get defensive, that should be an indicator that you have a problem. And if you immediately start going to right and wrong in that conversation, guess what? That is defensiveness. That's what's happening. And realizing how, how, what are these values? Like, there, by the way, there's great people who have written stuff that chronicle the history of faith and American politics being merged together and the destruction that has caused on both sides of the aisle. A lot of that stuff around. It's amazing, but what will it take to break us out of our entrenchment? The key is you have to have humility. You have to say, I might be wrong about this. In fact, that was some of the best advice one pastor gave me early in my ministry career. As I'm thinking about through these issues and having these conversations. He said, Mike, what if you're wrong? What's the worst that could happen? Even if you're very convinced of what you're thinking. What if you're wrong? And so I started like processing that through all sorts of things, which really wrecked me. Some people call that deconstruction, but that, that's some of the stuff that was happening. It did wreck me. I started questioning a lot of things, I started, but I started going outside of myself and especially my echo chambers, which may be a blessing of why I'm out on Facebook and Instagram this week, because they can be echo chambers, right? I mean, there are specific computer programs, algorithms written so that you have an echo chamber in social media, right? You like certain things, these people believe what I believe, so therefore, and they just keep feeding you things that get more extreme and more extreme and more extreme as you go along. And then you're like, oh, this is gospel truth. But that is like one side of many sides of what's happening. Is your gospel based in American politics? Jesus says you need to metanoia. You need to change your thinking. And I'm telling you, it's been very freeing to be delivered from my entrenchment. But I'm not all there yet. I don't know if I will be. And let's, let's be transparent. There are some values that the Republican Party has that may line up with Jesus. There are some values that the Democratic Party have that may line up with Jesus. Not all of them for either side, right? That's what makes it so hard for those of you who are trying to figure out how to navigate political life in America as a Christian. What do I do about this? Friends, your authority is not Republicans or Democrats or the American government, your authority is Jesus. Am I preaching? Please, please, please. And listen, here's what's going to happen, and this is why this is the worst church marketing sermon ever. You're going to get shot at from both sides. That's what's happened to me. I get shot at from my friends on all sides because of the seemingly wishy-washy posture, as they say, both sides that I have, allegedly, and all I'm saying is this, look, if you say that you're a Christian, a follower of Jesus, a Christ follower, that's what that means, you should pay attention to Jesus in the Gospels. We're doing that in the Gospel of Mark. You already know he's doing some pretty unpredictable things and pretty like weird things, pretty awesome things and ooh kind of things, like this moment. Like, what do you do? He's speaking the truth to power here, but he's not shutting them off. Right? He's given them an opportunity to change their thinking. You know, this isn't the first conversation he's had with them. I mean, he has multiple conversations with all the groups of people that critique him. Multiple. And as conversation goes on, he does get a little more frustrated, I'm sure, because they don't want to listen to him and hear his voice. But he does that. Pay attention to what Jesus is doing. Listen, you'll find out quickly he doesn't really match up with this American political party system value stuff. It just doesn't match up perfectly, one or the other. 
It challenges both of them. It affirms both of some of their values. And you get really confused. Like, what do I do? Just follow Jesus. And you might get, you probably will get shot from all sides. He's already warned that. Take up your cross. Taking up your cross is not an act of, like, um, praise. It's not an act of something that's, yay. I mean, you're, you're taking up a device that's designed to kill you. That's what he's telling his disciples to do and what is going to happen to him. So he already knows this. But he, you also know that the reason he's doing this is for all of us. So that these systems that we've created that are destructive can no longer have the final word. So that people will not exploit others. Other human beings made in God's image, which is not God's design. We are the pinnacle of his creation. And the question is, does your posture about gospel truth, is it rooted in some values of the American political system that are not very honoring to God? Maybe you're not even aware of it, and that takes humility to listen. The second challenge I said is a little more subtle, but it goes along with it. It makes sense. It's a follow-up from last week with this defensiveness. Because, look, and you know this wherever you're at, but especially me in this role, I mean, one thing I know, I definitely have critics. Like, every week. There's always somebody critiquing me. Now, there's some people that have no good intentions in that, and there's most people that do. But I have traumatic experiences from being critiqued by people in the church in the past where I've had to get through that and whatever. That's just my own personal stuff. However... I tend to get defensive about critique sometimes because now I start beating myself up and whatever. That's my problem. But it's an interesting thing to think about because I know some of you have talked to me about how frustrated you've been in these types of conversations, like really tense conversations or whatever as you're kind of wrestling with these complex things. And maybe it's like you feel like, well, this person's just gone off the deep end. And more than likely, that's what people think about you (laughs) and your views, right? And then we get so upset and we feel helpless, and then this critique, we get angry. Right? That's, that's, start, that's starting the point of defensiveness. And here's the question that I, I, I continually ask myself. And it has to deal with that value back there. In the back, my back left. Which is called curious together. And the question then is this. Are we curious about the criticism we receive? Or are we defensive? And and listen, the only way that you can break out of being entrenched in a particular way of living and thinking is if you're curious. Some people don't, you don't, I I know some people don't think they're curious, but if you're the type of person that is willing to be unentrenched in particular ways of thinking, that you might be wrong, you're curious. Are you more curious than you are defensive? Let me give you an example. Because these usually happen up in hard conversations, right? People get really passionate about whatever their views are about anything. And even if I wholeheartedly think, that is, like, dumb. I will never say that to them, of course, but that's what it feels like to me. And I, I want to get defensive and defend. No. They, they, they go crazy and they, they get really passionate. And I go, man, I'm really curious, which is a great phrase to use. That's a great phrase. I'm really curious. I'm curious. And some of you use that here. I'm very proud of you. Like, I'm, I'm curious you're very passionate about this perspective. Can you tell me more about why you're so passionate about this? Look, you don't have to agree with them, right? But what is that doing? You're actually interested in them. And you're not asking the question to not listen to the response, right? Like the Sanhedrin are doing. Like, why are you so passionate? Because what's interesting is that most of the time, I would say 95% of the time I ask that question to people, they tell a story of some traumatic experience or some v- deeply personal experience that I'm like, and at the end, here's what, I mean, this sounds really crazy to say this. A lot of the time I find myself saying, wow, that makes a lot of sense on why you'd be so passionately this way. Man, if I went through that situation, I don't know what I'd be thinking. I, don't, I might think the same way you do. But you wouldn't have known that if you weren't curious about them. If you weren't interested in their flourishing. 
I mean, think about that with you, right? There's moments in time where you were so convinced and you, you ended up like, you know, I'm not living the right way. I'm not thinking the right way. And someone came alongside you to convince you. But how did they do that? Did they give you a great argument? Some people did. Every once in a while, people convinced that way. But more than likely, I would probably guess that they were present with you in some way that made you feel like a person whose voice was heard. Right? Someone who gave you dignity. Even if they completely disagreed with whatever your posture was, they still would be your friend. They still would have coffee with you. They still were interested in, in, your rela- in, in the relationship with the other parts of your lives, about your kids and family and life and whatever. It's really interesting what happens if you have that posture toward people, if you're curious. That's why that is a value of our church. And it's not, man, it's not easy, friends. It's so much easier to be defensive. It's so much easier to be entrenched and say that I know the way and you don't. But man, I've been wrong so many times. I have to have the humility if I'm a person that is supposed to take up my cross to be curious. Jesus always gave the space to anybody to change their mind. No matter if he thought they were dead wrong. Always did. He spoke, and and then he also spoke the truth to power at the same time. That's the only way it works, friends. If you want to speak prophetically, to people, they have to know that you care. They have to. No one's, no one's going to want to think differently if you don't care about them, right? And Jesus has already shown that he cares about everybody. He cares about the people that the religious authorities said you shouldn't care about, but he did. And he still speaks this truth to them, saying this is the way God has attended things all along. And I'm giving you a chance So where are you today? Look, I know this brings a lot of stuff up. I'm, I'm sure, I mean, maybe I'll take shots in the, in the, the armor, non-armor. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. I'm, I'm ready for it. Because this is so, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really convinced. This is a critical piece of what makes us us here. Is how we practice this thing today. And I'm going to tell you right now, I know for a fact that there are a ton of people who are looking for a group of people who will provide that kind of space. And I'm being honest, you don't find that very much in this region of the country. I'm just going to be honest about that. I know because I've heard your stories. <laughs> I know because I've experienced that too. But I'm, I'm, I'm convinced if we can be the types of people who embody what this looks like, the good news is going to shine through. They're going to realize, wait, you mean that you care about me regardless of what I believe? Uh, Yeah. If I did a survey right now of all of you in this room about what your beliefs and views are in all sorts of arenas, some of you wouldn't associate with each other normally. You probably would because you're here. But like normally people wouldn't like, oh my gosh, you believe that or you do that or you support that or whatever. I'm, I'm telling you, friends, we have people from all over the map in this room right now. <laughs> it's crazy. But what's cool about it is I think we are trying to embody this. We care about these values around here because it is the embodiment of the gospel, which is what, called, what good news is. And when you do that, people will see who Jesus is, how much he cares, that he always gives space to know that you care, that he gives hospitality to anyone, even people who want to kill him. And friends, who is that for you this week? I don't know who that is for you. What does it look like to give space and to give hospitality, to be curious to those who even are your critics? Does it make you consider, maybe I need to think about this differently. I, I've said to some of my friends who, who have really, I mean, in my mind, off-the-wall views on things. I'll say things like, man, I've really never thought about it that way before. Because I'm, I'm really listening. Whether it changes my mind on things, I don't know. Sometimes it does. But I say, look, you know, I'm listening to you. I've never thought about it that way before. Because, look, I don't have it all 
nailed. I know when we can have that posture, that's a very compelling narrative of what it looks like to live out the good news of the gospel. Jesus. That's what he's doing. And at the same time, to be bold enough to speak the truth to power, but only if they know that you care. And look, you already know, it's very likely there's a high percentage that they might shoot at you as a result. I don't know about actually literally do that. Hopefully not. But like th- those, those critiques are going to come your way. They may, they may not even care. But that's fine because Jesus broke himself open and poured himself out for the salvation of everyone. And that's what he's calling every one of his followers to do. Let's pray. God, we know that we're likely to get shot on all sides of trying to practice this posture, and this is not easy. But God, you never said that this life would be easy. But you did say this life would be the flourishing life. And so, God, I pray that you would continue to challenge us and to encourage us in the way of the cross. God, we all need help. We all need rescue And God, you've provided the path to freedom, to true freedom, from all the ways that we destroy ourselves and each other. Will you help us to listen to your voice in the midst of all of this tension? And God, to embody the good news, to live it out every single day with all of those that we come in contact with. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. I'm sure it brought up a whole lot of things today, all sorts of things that came up. I, I knew that would happen. And if you need prayer, if, if you just want to kind of talk those, that story out with people, um, there's lots of people here that care. Carol's also one of those people that cares. She's standing over here by our, our value of prayer field. She's our prayer coordinator, by the way. We have a great prayer team. She would love to pray with you um, through that, whatever that is. And um, we don't have to understand all the details. You don't have to share that whole story. You can just ask for prayer, and we're glad to do that. So make sure you take advantage of that afterwards. Let's all stand together as we hear this good word. That's what benediction means. It just means good word, just a, a word of blessing. May you be a people that lives out curiosity, that always gives space for others to change your thinking. That always gives space for you to change your thinking. May you walk in humility in the way of the cross, and may that good news be lived through you every single day this week. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and everybody said. Hey, thanks for watching the podcast. If you want to connect with us, click one of the links uh, in the description there to get to our page where there's all sorts of ways that you can find out more information about our church community, uh, what we're doing, and how you can get involved with that. Uh, Hope you continue to stay. Make sure you like and subscribe. Share this with your friends if you think it's meaningful. And hope you have a wonderful week. Grace and peace, friends.